Hey, I'm Derek Kirk of Effectatron, and I'm going to show you how the new Node Editor workflow works today and some tips and tricks on how to make that transition from the Redshift Shader Graph over to the new Node Editor workflow uh, a little easier for you and hopefully a little smoother. Kind of explain some things, how they work. There's a lot of similarities, but there's enough differences that it feels different enough that you might have to restart. Uh, you don't, you'll pick it up very quickly, and I'll also show you how to load up the old way in case you still want to do it that way. Real quick, I just want to say be sure to check out DerekKirk.net for all of my content and check out our courses on CG shortcuts and my courses on Skillshare. All of these are going to be updated with new content as well with the new big changes with Redshift. So be sure to stay tuned uh, and check those out. Now, the first thing you need to do, like I mentioned in my other videos, is you need to make sure that you change your render renderer to a Redshift in order for this to even pop up. So you have the option of these new Redshift materials. So firstly, if you notice, when we go to create new material, we hit this plus sign, it'll still create an RS material for us. But there's actually a new material that might actually be better than the RS material, and that is in the standard material, this new standard. So I think they called it standard because they want it to be the new standard for an RS material. Basically, there's a lot of different settings that it has. The RS material doesn't. When we double click this, you notice we don't get the shader graph like we used to. It's now different looking. And we're gonna show you how to kind of create this, work with this new workflow to make it seem very familiar to the old workflow so that it's an easy transition into this new style. Basically, we have different properties and things here, like things like thin film, the transmission settings are different, and the reflection and the subsurface scattering sessions are different, as well as we have a geometry section now. We're gonna go over each of these in later videos in depth. We're gonna go over the thin film for sure in the next video, and then the transmission stuff is really cool. A lot of cool changes with this, and the metalness is a really cool factor. And we're gonna cover that and the thin film in the next video. So be sure to subscribe and ring that bell so that you know when that comes out, because it will be very soon. The fastest way to add new nodes and things to your objects is actually really easy. All you need to do is, if say you want to add a max on noise to your color here, right click here and then just start typing. It looks like you have to type in here, but you don't. You just start typing or max on noise. And that's going to filter out all of our options here. So the only thing we have here is max on noise. So we didn't need to open up the asset browser or anything to bring these things in. Really nice way if you know exactly what you're looking for, how to get to that really quickly. So once we've added that max on noise, you'll see it adds it right here. We can either twirl this down and see all of our options here, or we can just click a max on noise and that will bring up max on noise in this window by itself. And if we ever want to go back to the base properties, you can go back to the base properties by clicking over here. Or if this is inside of a chain of multiple things, you simply can hit up and that will bring it back up a layer. So that's kind of the workflow for that. Really nice if you know exactly what you want, how to add things in super quickly. I'm going to make a copy of this really quick and just change the name of that to Maxon 1 just so we can see this as an option. Let's unhook our max on noise here. And so now if I right click here, and say I've made noises in my material and that I already have created, and I'm mixing them together and layering them together in a certain way. I want to right click this and I type in max on noise. I have the option of existing nodes now where I have my two yellow nodes that are named, or if I go to texture, I have the blue dot, which means it's a new node. So we have existing nodes and new nodes. So if I select an existing node, and then I want to actually say, oh, I clicked the wrong node. Right click, go ahead and type in max on noise. Or if you've named your node, you can find it that way. You can go to replace node, you have this option now. And if you just replace that with a new one. It's really a really nice way to just kind of speed up your workflow. And you don't actually have to even go into the node editor and connect things manually if you don't want to. In order to open up the node editor, you have a couple things you can do. You can click node editor here, and that will open up the node editor. Or you can control click this dot here. So anywhere that you see that has a dot, all of these attributes all have dots by them, which means that they all can have something plugged into them. So that's pretty cool. So now we have our node editor here and it's a separate window from our material editor, which to me right off the bat is a little annoying, um, but we're gonna deal with that in just a minute. Now what we'll do, we have our node editor here and you can see we have a couple options. We have our node editor, it's not the espresso style, but there are some benefits to this. The, the overall gist of these are gonna be very familiar. Basically you still have an output node, you still have to put things in the surface, you have displacement, you have volume, all of the same things, color, metalness, 
Uh, you have the same values and things. One thing that I really like is a big improvement is that they added the bump map as a default because a lot of things you make have bump maps in them and you just always have to go in and go to overall and then find the bump input and plug it in. And now you can just quick snap it straight to it. And you'll notice that some of these are yellow and some of these are white and some of these are purple. And these are just suggestions basically. Uh, we can connect multiple colors to different things. So output color can definitely go into the surface. Huge upgrade is that it snaps when you get close. So you don't have to kind of get it exactly right. Also, if you don't see what you want to connect it to, you don't have to go into a little tiny box up here. You can just throw this on the object somewhere and it'll bring up the options of where to plug that in for you. Everything is available right here. So see, once that's connected, you get a visual display. If you don't like these displays, you can hide them, but I think they're kind of nice. And I will say so far in the note editor, the actual preview things work a whole lot better than they used to. Almost always my previews never really updated, especially if I had IPR going, which I do have going in the viewport in the background. So I normally used to just have one or the other, and now it seems that this at least works fairly well. Okay, so let's go on and continue more about kind of the workflow here. So we want to add a new node. So let's say we want to add a max on noise. There are a couple ways that we can do this. Now this is pretty cool if you bring in a bunch of textures, you can just, once you have your textures in here, you can just click and drag them in here and it won't connect them to anything, but it will make texture nodes for them. You'll have all of those texture options here. So if you know what you wanna click, it's gonna make it a lot easier to do like the diffuse for this one. Then you can click, uh, you know, click this one and do the, Reflection, roughness, click this one, do the transmission, that kind of thing. So they will make adding textures a little bit easier, I believe. But let's say we want to add a max on noise to this, but we don't want to go through here and scroll through all these connect nodes. We want to hit this plus box here. Now this is also a little bit annoying and there's a better way to do this as well. And I'll show you that in just a second. Cause you can see once I clicked off and rearranged it, it just disappeared, which is kind of, yeah. So we'll click this button and that brings up the node section of our asset browser. So here's what we do inside the asset browser. We have all of these things. You've got all your color channels, your environment, your legacy nodes, your light nodes, material nodes. You've got all your math, your colors, everything that we're familiar with, all of our texture nodes that are all still here. They're just laid out in kind of a different look. And they're not super easy to find. Like I don't like the idea of having to click through all of these. So here's what I suggest you do is what you do is you close that, go into your asset browser, go to the nodes tab, and you'll realize all this stuff is not texture nodes. All you need to do, and I don't know why this is the way it is, but you need to click inside your node editor and that will change your asset browser into the correct asset browser for these nodes. So now we have access to all of our nodes that we're used to. So what you can do now is it's, it's a little tedious, but you only have to do it one time is go through and click this little heart to favorite the ones you use the most. Like I use a ramp, max on noise, texture node, curvature. I use those a lot as well as some of the color correction ones like color layer and stuff like that. Those are the ones I use the most as well as go make sure you go into utility, go to surface, and that's where you're going to find bump blenders, bump maps, displacement, displacement maps, and round corners. Favorite all of those. Now, when you go to your favorites, you're going to have access to all of those right off the bat. And you can change the layout of these from being like a straight up line and adjust the scale of these as you wish. And then you can do icons as well and adjust the scale with this slider. So now that we have all that in here, we can either close that. And so now when we hit plus here, we have our favorites and we have all of those organized for us. So now we can go ahead and use that. Or if you want this to feel more like Redshift, we'll open up that browser and then the favorites will not be there. We need to click inside of our node editor that will generate the favorites we want. Grab these three lines, slide it over here into the top left of this so that it adds it onto the side. And then do the same with this material editor as well. Grab these three lines and then drag it into the top right. So now we've kind of reconstructed a familiar look inside of the node editor that feels more like what we're used to with the shader graph. We've got our list of nodes over here. We've got our node editor workspace here where we can just click and drag and throw this into. So it could be like a bump map. We can just plug that in and put texture input and then the bump purple to purple, easy peasy. And so now we have all these options. Now the thing you'll have to get used to is clicking on these is not going to change it over here. 
you so it's very similar looking, but the workflow still is slightly different. And one thing that's different is that now everything is actually in the attributes panel down here. So we can make our attributes panel a little bigger. So now when we click max on noise, we have all of that here, bump is here. And you could drag this and put this in here if you want it to be more familiar and be more like the Redshift uh, version of it. But do note that this attribute panel is the same attribute panel for all of your geometry. So things like cameras and stuff are all gonna show up in here. So I don't recommend doing that unless you wanna swap back and forth. So I would recommend you doing this, maybe leaving this up on your side monitor uh, while you work or something like that. So you have this big IPR window, which I think works a lot better in the new Redshift. Uh, so you have this workflow. And so you can do it that way if you want, and that should feel more familiar. So speaking of controlling these and having them appear in the attribute panel down here, if that's not the way you want to work and you just want to work in a full screen space like this, uh, basically when you click these, nothing's going to happen. But what we have here is everything now is in this window. So because we have a max on noise plugged into our bump and that's plugged into our geometry, if we scroll down here to our geometry, we see we have a bump map here and our little white circle has become a solid circle with a line coming in. And that means that something is plugged in. So you can right click and remove that or replace the node. The main thing is you have this little twirl down and you can either twirl this down and keep working inside this window here and you'll have the option of all of your bump map nodes. And then instead of that, you'll see that you have the max on noise plugged into your bump map. So you can twirl that down. So you have everything inside of here in one view. But if this is like too much for you and you don't like to look and scroll through all this, all you need to do is you can actually just click the bump map word. And clicking that word will open up just the bump map node options. And inside of that, you'll see you have the max on noise that's connected. If you want to look at just the max on noise, just simply click max on noise, and that will bring up just the noise option. And the cool thing is it shows you now what it looks like if you just connected it to the surface. You used to have to say output to surface to see how it was being applied uh, on your objects and stuff. It kind of gives you a little preview of that here, you've got your material preview and just your node by itself. So you can see kind of how those two are working together, which is really nice. And on that note, you actually can even go in here. Let's increase this. If we put this material on our shader ball here and we plug this into say the color data, you're gonna see that we now actually have support in our render preview. This is the IPR, this is the render preview. Uh, so we're not rendering, this is just the viewport. We actually have access to see these nodes and even the bump being applied. So when we have a texture or anything, we can finally see it inside of the viewport without having to have IPR going. So it's gonna make it a lot easier to tell what's on what. Uh, this is a huge, this is fantastic. It should have been in Redshift the whole time. Uh, so, but this is really nice. It's a very open workflow. You can do it multiple different ways, whichever way feels best for you. I think it's really nice. Uh, I think I'll still kind of work in this kind of hybrid of inside of these three windows, as well as the attribute panel. It doesn't feel as streamlined, but I'm sure the more I use it, the more I realize I'm probably not gonna use this attribute panel as much as I'll just use stuff inside of here. So that is how the new node editor system workflow basically works and how you can make it feel more comfortable and familiar to you. Hopefully this will kind of help you kind of get used to the new node editor style and workflow. Uh, and hopefully the, some of those tips and tricks with how this works will kind of start clicking and make that transition a little easier for you. Now, if you do not want to learn this new system and you just want to use the old system, that's totally fine. You can go to edit and then go down to preferences. Underneath the renderer, go to Redshift, uncheck node materials for presets, okay? And you're gonna think, okay, cool, that's all I need to do. And then you double click your material and realize it's still popping up. It doesn't change it for existing materials, but when you create a new material, that one will pop up with the old legacy view. Now it's not the same, and this is kind of annoying because they kind of make it seem pretty obvious that they don't want you to use it this way because they've taken away the attribute panel inside of here. So now it's a little buggy. You can see I click my standard material and it's not showing up here. I click out of here, click back in, now it does show up. So we've kind of got this weird in between. So if we want, we can drag this on and plug this in over here. So now we have our old school 
legacy window. The only problem is, is that now this panel also controls our lights and cameras and, and geometry options. So that's not ideal. Uh, you cannot make a copy of this window, which I wish you could do. So you could have one inside of here and one over here. If you ever lose your way and how it all is, you can always go back and reset your loadouts. And then once you have it all set up kind of a way you want, go to customization and make sure to save that layout how you like it, name it, save it. If you're gonna use it a lot, save it as your startup and save it as your default so you can come in and do that. So yes, this will work as your old school view, but it may not be the best for the new workflow. You will have all of your settings and things, how you recognize them, but you're still gonna have to deal with this attribute panel which you could leave down here if you want to. It's really not that bad, especially if you're used to keeping your viewport, your shader graph down here, that may not be that strange to you. So you can definitely keep that in mind. If you found this workflow helpful, be sure to leave a like, it helps me out a lot on my channel. And definitely be sure to check out the next video where we're gonna go over more of these things inside of the shader graph here. We're gonna go over the mentalist value as well as the thin film in the video coming out very soon. And so be sure to ring that bell for the notifications of when that's coming out. Thanks for watching.